Okay, so how is everyone today? Fantastic. <clears throat> so, uh, it's Thursday. This is the only lecture of the week because uh, the fourth was off. Uh, just as a reminder of technical matters, quizzes seven and eight are this week, both of them. Uh, next week, quizzes nine and ten were both scheduled, but now quiz nine has been canceled so that next week there is only quiz ten. Uh, then next next week, there will be only quiz eleven because there was only one lecture this week. So any question about any of those logistic scheduling matters. <clears throat> okay, so we're in chapter nine. Uh, and specifically we're in section 9.1, which is called something like, what do they want to call it? Uh, functions of several variables. Okay, so <clears throat> I want to try and so in the first place, there's a lot of there's a lot of details to cover in chapter nine, but uh, in order to make sure you don't get lost in the sea of details, I'd like to give you um, a bird's eye view of what it what it looks like. So in calculus one. you more or less are um, concerned with functions that have this signature, reels to reels. So what does that mean, signature is reels to reels? Well, abstractly, or I guess really more concretely, I'd, I'd like for you to have the thought that a function is like a machine that accepts inputs and produces outputs. To have signature real to real means that, that uh, we're talking about a function that accepts a real input and produces a real output. That's, what, that's the kind of functions that, um, that you deal with in Calculus 1. So there's sort of two halves to Calculus. So this is the input axis, and this is the output axis. And depending on the context, sometimes this is called the independent axis, and this one the dependent axis, or the x-axis and the y-axis, or what have you. OK, so suppose that we draw um, a function. So there's a nice function, and let's say that this is y is f of x. Part of the part of the um, <coughs> idioms. What's the, what's the right word? It's not idiom. It's like uh, convention. Part of the convention that you have to understand is that well, this is a particular input value. So that's a particular input. How do, you, how do you visually determine which output it corresponds to? So what do you do? Mm -hmm. You say, OK, well, I'll draw a vertical up to here. And then, oh, that's where I hit the function. That means that 
that input corresponds to that output. <coughs> I didn't draw the output axis quite high enough, but you understand what I mean. So this input corresponds to that output. Okay, then you can imagine moving this input around and you'd see, you'd see this fence moving around and getting shorter and taller as necessary and this one moving up and down uh, as necessary. So about half of the calculus point of view is the following, is that, well, if you were on this, uh, if you were on this red drawing and you were really, really small, then locally your red world would look flat. It would look flat in the sense that if you were standing out in the middle of Kansas, say, it really does look flat. So, you know, on the one hand, we can kind of poke fun at the ignorance of, of people who came thousands of years before us who more or less universally believed that the earth was flat. Like, ha-ha. But, on the other hand, it actually is a very good approximation. It really is. For <laughs> comparing the size of a human to the size of the earth. So the calculus, half, literally half of the calculus point of view is that, is that um, if the object that you live on is smooth, and if you're really small in comparison to it, then locally it looks flat. So here is the best local flat approximation of the red world at that point. So the blue flat approximation is really pretty good near that point. It's not, it's not good when you start getting over here or over there, but it's very good at that point. So what is the name for the local flat approximation of a function at a point? What is the name of this line? The tangent line. So this, this, is the, this is the core idea of half of calculus, is that locally things are flat. Locally they're flat. Uh, so I don't mean horizontal. No, don't confuse me. Uh, I mean locally they look flat like this line is flat. Um, now, as for a computation point of view in calculus, you go on and you want to figure out all different manners uh, and techniques and strategies to compute, uh, to compute the best flat approximation. So what is the name of the machinery that gives you the best flat approximation? I'm fishing for a D word. Derivative, right? So half of calculus is figuring this out. Locally things are flat. The machinery to calculate this is called derivative. This is called the differential point of view. Every, locally everything is flat. Okay, now, that's if, if um, your function is, is smooth. So this red function that I've drawn, is it smooth at every point? No, right? There's a pointy place. Right here, at this place, there is no tangent. Because if you were a tiny creature living in the red world, Okay, and you were on the pointy place, then it wouldn't matter how small you were. Alternatively, it wouldn't matter how close with a microscope you look at this red thing at that point because it's never going to look flat there. It's always going to be pointy. So this function cannot be approximated with a flat thing at that place. Computationally, that 
that would, if you were attempting to compute the derivative, the derivative there wouldn't exist. That's what that means. Whereas at every other point, at least on what I've drawn, the derivative would exist because it's smooth everywhere else. <clears throat> okay, so any question about uh, that? Any question about that? Okay, the other point of view in calculus is that you're going to take a function and now you've got some domain A to B and this again is function Y is F of X And the question, the other question you want to address is, well, how much area is in here? How much area is in there? Well, what's the answer to that question? So the answer to this question, how do we compute the, the best local flat approximation of a function at a point? The answer to that question is derivative. What's the answer to the question, how much area is in here? Integral, right? So this is called the integral point of view. Okay, so for this one, symbolically, the differential point of view, in the end, the answer is the derivative operator. And symbolically, the answer, uh, so the derivative of f of x, I guess. And here, the answer to the question is, well, it's the integral. And then, the, the miracle of it all, really, is that in calculus one, for functions that have signature, reals to reals, that these two things, in fact, can be completely reconciled to each other and found to be just opposites of the same, opposite sides of the same coin. And what makes, what, what illustrates that these are actually just opposite sides of the same coin? What's the name for that? Not that. I mean, that's mixed in there, but I'm fishing for something that starts with F. The fundamental theorem. Fundamental theorem says that, well, in fact, in a very specific way, these are just opposites of each other. Opposite sides of the same coin. So now, we're going to do the same thing, the same kind of thing. We're going to uh, try and figure out the best local flat approximation of things. And we're going to try to figure out, um, in this case, it won't be areas. It'll be volumes. Okay, And the answer to the question is going to be something like derivative and something like integral. Now. As it happens, as it happens, this is for those of you who just, you know, might one day think, you know what, I'm going to go ahead and take a whole bunch of math courses. It was just, I have such fond memories of applied calculus too, I'm going to do it. Well, we're going to talk about best local flat approximations of functions, and we're also going to talk about how to uh, break volumes into infinitely many pieces into something like an integral, but in this class we're never going to get to something analogous to the fundamental theorem. And it's one of the sad things uh, about this class, in my opinion. You can't, you can't go far enough to, and to, to, to tie it all up with a neat bow. You can't quite get that far. That doesn't mean that there isn't something, it just means that we're not going to get to it. And that, uh, that thing is not called the fundamental theorem, it's called Stokes' theorem. But, alas. Okay, <clears throat> so now we're going, to, we're going to go down that same path, except the only thing that's going to be different is we're going to change the signature of the functions. So in calculus two, 
or this, this, this region of calculus that we're in, which I'll just call calculus two. Now the functions have signature R2 to R, which means that, uh, if you like, it means that when you, um, when you, the, the inputs, now you need two scalar inputs. Like not just one scalar, but you're gonna need two of them. But, but then after that, only one scalar is output. So for example, I could give you this function. F of x and y is say x squared plus three xy. So that's an example of a function that has signature r squared to r. So notice that if you were to substitute in an x, a specific value for x, and a specific value for y, the kind of thing that you'd have in the end is a scalar. It would be a real number. So just to make sure it's utterly clear, let's, for example, plug in f of um, 2, 3. So that is to say, I want you to, everywhere that you see x, I want you to replace it with what? 2. And everywhere you see y, I want you to replace it with 3. So this would be uh, 2 squared, and then plus 3 times 2 times 3. So that would be 18 plus 4 is 22. So we had to plug in two scalar values, and then out came one, one scalar value. OK. So that's interesting. The way that you write this down, when you plot things like this, what you're plotting is you plot something that looks like z is f of x and y. So now contrary to your, to your previous experience, um, where y was the, out, the name of the output symbol, now y is the name of, of one of the input symbols. And what is the name of the output symbol? Z, right? The name of the output thing is Z. Okay, so now to draw these, if we wanted to plot these, in the first place, um, I'd like for you to consider that there's, in a sense, two possibilities. So these are both three-dimensional axes. So specifically, uh, ignoring that one for a moment, this axis, just that part, is in the plane of the page. So it's, it's drawn on the page. And then this one, we're going with the fiction that it's coming out of the page. So this one's coming out of the page. OK, so just like in Calculus 1, just like in Calculus 1, uh, the output is going to be the vertical axis. So this one is z. This is z. This is z. They're both z. <clears throat> and what we want to do now is we want to figure out what is the correct placement of x and y. So here's one possibility that this one is x and this one is y, and then the other possibility is that this one is x, and this one is y. So do you observe that there, there's two different scenarios? So which one is the correct scenario? The one on the right. So the, the reason why it's the one on the right is because of the following. <clears throat> there's a convention about determining which which is the correct order. And the convention is, is you have to take your right hand. So you take your right hand, and then <clears throat> you put your thumb in the direction of the output. So thumb is going up. 
and then notice that from the first variable, x, to the second variable, y, that is the direction that fingers curl, right? So from first to second. Okay, so from first, x, coming out of the page, to the second, parallel to the page. First variable, second variable. First variable, second variable. Output variable. Notice what happens when I try to do that with, um, with the other one. So I, I put my thumb in the, in the direction of output for this one right here. And then my fingers in the direction of the first one. My fingers don't, they don't come back around that way in, for the short angle, for the acute angle. <coughs> okay, so this one, but this one would work with my left hand, right? Because if I take, take my left hand and put my thumb in the direction of the output and my fingers in the direction of the first variable, then they curl to the second. Okay, for that reason, this one is called a left-handed coordinate system because it agrees with your left hand, and this one a right-handed coordinate system uh, because it agrees with the right hand. Right-handed coordinate system is the coordinate system that we use. So this one, this one here is left-handed. We don't use it. This one is right-handed. This is the one we use. Now, there's no, there's no good reason to have selected one over the other. However, this is universal, and you will just be wrong if you use the wrong convention. Just like there's no, in, in the United States, there is no good reason to have selected driving on the right versus driving on the left side of the road. There's no good reason to make the initial selection. <laughs> but, there's, but there's extremely good reasons to, to, for you to leave here and drive on the right <laughs> when you leave. <laughs> because that's the convention that we all use. Okay. <clears throat> Which is probably just because, you know, like, uh, what's, what's the name for someone who is able to use both of their hands more or less equally well? Ambidextrous. So, so it may be interesting for you to find out what that, what that word means. So in the first place, ambi means both. And what does dextrous mean? Uh, the M -A M -A N is the prefix for hand. So dexterous means right. So to be ambidextrous, that word sort of literally means to have two right hands. That's what, that's what, that's what that word means. <laughs> yeah, and th yeah, and then, okay, the word like when someone's real shady looking and they, they look like they're about to be part of some illegal or illicit circumstance. You know, what do you call those people? Sinister. Right? And what does sinister mean? Left-handed. <laughs> That's what that means. Can you believe that? That's terrible. I'm, I'm absolutely serious. Dexter and sinister mean right hand and left hand. Yeah. Not, I'm I'm not pulling any legs or making any jokes. Okay, discrimination against left-handed people is a long-standing issue in the, the history of, of human beings. But let's not go there. Okay, so, so we're always going to use a right-handed coordinate system. So let's draw an example of the differential point of view. Differential <coughs> point of view. <coughs> okay. So now, because there's two inputs, 
because there's two inputs. Uh, let's say that we're talking about a function. So in the first place, this one, this, the, the output axis is z. Uh, this one is y, and this one is x, because we're using a right-handed coordinate system. Let's say that you're allowed to, to input y values in this range, so like from here to here. Those are the y values you can input. And let's say you can input any x value between here and here. So to put something concrete on it, you know, maybe this is 2 and this is 4 and this is three, and this is six. So you can only input x values between two and four, and y values between three and six. So I have a question for you. Is, is this a legitimate input? No. Why not? It's between x is two and x is four. This is like x is three. What's wrong with that? Ah, but it's not in the correct range of y values. <coughs> so can you see that the domain of this function, uh, the domain of the function that I'm about to draw is this rectangle right here. In order to be able to plug in something, you've got to be in here. And you can't be out, out of here. Okay, now we're going to draw a function. <coughs> so just like, just like I've drawn more or less this function, Okay, 50 times in the notes so far, a stereotype function. Okay, now here comes the stereotype function that has signature r squared to r. So I make a little rectangle in the, in the input plane. And then for each corner, I just go up a more or less random amount, straight up, straight up. So now I just connect the dots, more or less. So like these two are connected by, by this, say. So those two are connected like that. Uh, maybe this one is connected like this. This one like that. And that one like that. So what I want you to imagine is this is like a smooth surface that you could, you could, um, <coughs> you could wax, like if you were waxing a car. You could, uh, you could rub it and it would polish it shiny. Okay, now the differential point of view is the following. That suppose we're at this particular value, this particular input value right there, which is a legitimate input value because it's inside of that rectangle. Then this point corresponds to a point on that surface. And we can figure it out by just from this point going straight up to the surface. And maybe it hits the surface right there. Now, if you were on that surface, and if this is a smooth surface, so it's, it, doesn't have any, it doesn't have any seams, it doesn't have any ridges, it doesn't have any points, it's extremely smooth. If you were on this surface, on this red object, and you were very, very tiny, and you were shrinking, getting smaller and smaller, then eventually, eventually, you, the world would, would look flat. I don't mean horizontal. I don't mean parallel to the input. I mean it would look flat, just like, just like Kansas looks flat. Uh, so what kind of flat would it be? Would it be a tangent line? What would it be? Tangent line? Would this look like a, if, if you shrank yourself really small right there at that point, would, would the world start to look like a line to you? It would, it would be a flat thing, but then what's the, what's the special name for this flat one? So it's not a tangent line, it's a tangent plane, yeah. So, so this is just my artist's approximation, <laughs> artist's impression of a tangent plane right there. So 
So like the, the Earth is a globe, more or less. And at any point of the globe, you can attach the tangent plane. And it's an excellent, excellent approximation of the Earth for human-sized objects. Now, if you attach a tangent plane in the middle of campus, you could walk okay, on that tangent plane for the entire size of campus and you would not be able to measure the difference. Now, if you were to walk over to El Paso, which is, which is 11 hours drive from here to the west, but still in Texas, <laughs> and you were to be on the tangent plane that was attached at UTD, you would now be several hundred miles above the surface of the Earth. So at that point, it's not a good approximation anymore. So this is the differential point of view. So just like we were interested in, in calculating tangent lines, we're going to be interested in calculating tangent planes. Okay? Now, one particular thing that we were interested in from Calculus 1, <coughs> in Calculus 1, we were interested in things like this. So if this is a calculus one function, we'd be really interested in this point right here at the top. So this is <coughs> real to real. So how, <coughs> pardon me, how do you, what is the calculus one way that you detect that you have made it to the top? So on the one hand, you could make a, a slope chart, right? Everybody, I think, has had enough of that. But what must be true about the tangent uh, flat, the tangent line up here at the top? It's got to be horizontal. So in particular, at the top, the derivative, the first derivative is 0. And then furthermore, for the, in this particular mm -hmm. case, what's true about the second derivative? second derivative is negative. So from the calculus, calculus one point of view for functions that take scalars to scalars, you can maximize a function by finding a place where the first derivative is zero and the second derivative is negative. That'll tell you. You've made it to a maximum. And then similar things will tell you when you've made it to a minimum. Okay. Part of what we're going to do in calculus two is that now we're going to have functions whose sig signature is r squared to r, and instead of them looking like that, they're going to look like, perhaps, little sombreros or something like this. I hope you take my meaning. That's about as good as I'm able to do. This is like a, like a hat. Okay. If we had a hat sitting on the table, then we could, we could figure out which point was highest. So perhaps it's this point. Maybe that's the top, uh, the top of the, the function there, the highest point. What will be true about the tangent surface there? It also will be horizontal also will be horizontal, but now you've got to be a little bit careful because there's two directions to travel and it is, it is believe it or not, just fine for the tangent surface to be horizontal in one direction but not in the other. So let's, let's let me explain. <coughs> so here I'm standing on a horizontal surface. And then you can imagine the point that's at the top of my head. Supposing I move to the side at all, this way or this way, is the elevation of the point on the top of my head changing? It's, it's not, right? Furthermore, if I step forward or back, it also doesn't change. Okay? Because I'm standing on a horizontal surface. No matter where I stand, you get out of tape measure and you can say, oh, there it is, or if I go over there, it's the same. So, 
Now, I want you to imagine that I'm standing on this, I'm standing on this horizontal surface, but somehow I have supernatural powers, and I can tilt the floor this way. So now, I, and to be very specific, I'm standing on the axis, a very stiff bar of rotation of the floor, and it's going this way. So that, in fact, I'm not moving. The floor is just tilting exactly on the bar that I'm standing on. So now, does, does the elevation of the point on my head change when I do this? It doesn't, right? Because I'm still walking on that bar. So I'm not going up and down. So this direction is horizontal. And nothing changes. But if I walk forward, then I'll you know, this kind of thing where I go down. So it's perfectly possible to be horizontal in one direction, but not the other direction. So to be at the top of the sombrero, the tangent surface needs to be horizontal in all directions. Okay, so any question about this? We're going to be very interested in this, finding where things are flat. Uh, but do observe that, that just like in calculus of functions of this signature, you have the same problem as before. So here, you're at a maximum. But you, have a, you have a horizontal tangent, you're at a maximum. Here you have a horizontal tangent and you're at a minimum, right? So both of these have that same problem. You're at the minimum, horizontal tangent. You're at a maximum, horizontal tangent. So we're going to have to find a way to distinguish. Good. Any question about this? <coughs> So the other thing is we'll have the integral point of view. Which is just like um, calculus 1. So now we have some object, some surface. And now, instead of asking how much area is under this curve, which doesn't make sense, what is the question we're going to ask? What's the volume? What's the volume under this surface? And we're going to do it exactly the same way that we did it for calculus one, and that is to say that well, I don't know, I don't know what the volume is. So let's define what volume is. And the way that we'll define what volume is is we'll say, OK, if you take a little element of the rectangular coordinate system, that is to say, you have one measurement that's orthogonal to another measurement that's orthogonal to another one, so in three different directions. We're going to call this, this three-dimensional object, just like we said rectangle. You know, we named what a rectangle was. We're going to have to name what a, a three-dimensional rectangle is. By the way, does anyone know the name of a three-dimensional rectangle? It's not a very common thing. So it's called a parallelopiped. Wow, I'm just going to say three-dimensional rectangle. So they have volumes, little boxes. So we could, we, could, we could cut this volume into pieces and then estimate it, say we cut it into eight pieces. We could estimate the volume of each piece with a box. And we can make overestimates and we can make underestimates. But at, either, at any rate, how can we get more accurate than with using eight boxes? 
<laughs> more boxes, right? And then if it's an engineering problem, perhaps 8 million boxes is sufficient. But we, this is a calculus class, so we want to know the exact answer. So yes, we are going to use an infinite number of boxes. So the calculus point of view is that literally volumes volumes are composed of infinitely many infinitesimal boxes. Mm -hmm. And then we can find the volume of, of any particular uh, shape by just summing up the individual volumes of infinitely many infinitesimal boxes. Good. So any question about this? Now, there's a lovely thing that connects the differential point of view and the integral point of view, but we're not going to get to it. So that being said, let's, let's um, <clears throat> start down the path. So for example, suppose that we have f of x and y is 4x squared plus 3xy plus 5. So in the first place, I would like for you to evaluate f of, say, um, 2, 3. Well, that would be 4 multiplied by 2 squared plus 3 multiplied by 2 multiplied by 3 plus 5. So is there any question about plugging stuff in? Okay, then the arithmetic is what? 3 times 3 is 9 times 2 is 18. 23 plus, so I can't do that. 23 plus 16, 39. 39. So let's try and think about what this means. <clears throat> if we were to draw an axis, then in the first place I need help remembering which one is which. So which one's going up? Z. Okay, which one is this one? This one is y. And then by process of elimination, that one's x. OK. So where is the point 2, 3? Where is the input point 2, 3? OK. So how can we sort of, I guess my question is, is how can we draw it like in a convincing way? Like, yeah, there it is, 2, 3. Where, where is it? Well, let's draw. Maybe this is like 1, and this is 2, and this is 3, and this is 1, 2, 3. Then where is the point 2, 3? <clears throat> well, let's think about it for a moment. We want to know where x is 2. Let's find all of the places in the input where x is 2. Well, here is the x-axis, and that's where x is 2, right there. Right? And then all of the inputs are on this plane. <coughs> so everywhere that x is 2 is this line. Everywhere on that line, x is 2. Okay. By analogy, where, where, where are all of the places where y is 3? Right, so here's, here's y is 3 on the y-axis, and now I, I can draw a line. And notably, to make your drawing look good, what direction does the line need to be going? Parallel to that one, right? So, so not, like, 
not like coming out here or something like that. Rather, it's got to be parallel to this line. So to get, a, to get lines to be parallel, my trick is I point the line toward me. So now that it's pointing toward me, <laughs> I can probably do it, more or less. So where is the point two, three? Right, right there. So that's the input point two, three. And then the output is 39. So what, it, what that's saying is that you could now move parallel to the z-axis and come up here, and then there's some point like right there. What are the coordinates of that three-dimensional point? 2, 3, 39. So you've plotted a point <laughs> on, on one of these functions. Good, so then now what I'd like for you to understand is that in principle you could plot any function whatsoever by just taking any function and then plugging in millions and millions of points and just plotting them. Okay? And it would be as tedious as it sounds. <clears throat> so, now for that function, two, I would like for you to compute f of x plus h comma y. And I want you to simplify it as much as possible. Okay, well, in the interest of time, this would be 4 multiplied by x plus h squared and then plus 3 multiplied by x plus h y and then plus 5. So I'm going to simplify it in a moment, but is there any question how this occurred? Okay, so then, what is x plus h all squared? X squared plus 2x. Very good. So x squared plus 2xh plus h squared. And then multiplying that part out, that would be 3xy plus 3hy. Plus five. And then I'll distribute the four so that it's four x squared plus eight x h plus four h squared plus three x y plus three h y plus five. Beautiful. Okay. How about Please compute um, f of x plus h comma y minus f of x y and then all divided by h and I want you to do so assuming that h is not zero.
So I'm going to write something here. So how about 4x squared plus 8xh plus 4h squared plus 3xy plus 3hy plus 5 and then minus 4x squared plus 3xy plus 5 and then all of this over h. Okay. So I'd like for someone to tell me what's wrong with what I've written. Yeah, some parentheses are missing. So let's, let's be clear about it, is that, you know, I'm asking you to evaluate this expression, which means that you're going to substitute things in. So anytime you substitute things in, there's parentheses around it. So like there's a slot right here, a red slot. Stuff is going to be put in, in there. So if we, if we put these red parentheses here, here they are, here they are. So now, in comparison to the, what was previously written, as a coincidence, those red parentheses have no effect. They don't change the answer. Okay. However, because we're making another substitution, this one, into the green slot, well, the green parentheses go right here. Now, do those green parentheses change the answer? <clears throat> they do, right? They change it a lot. Whereas before, this was saying this, this, this would have eventually meant add 5. Now this is going to be eventually going to mean subtract 5 because it's subtract all that business. So I'm just reminding you of these things because these are the kinds of errors that I see with great frequency during this section. Okay, now, let's simplify. Notice a neat thing about this particular computation is that uh, in the numerator, the only things that remain are things with h. So this 4x squared has no h's, and it gets canceled by that 4x squared. Whereas this 8xh has an h and has nothing to get canceled by. So, after all possible cancellation, what you see is 8xh plus 4h squared plus 3hy over h. That's nice. So, uh, now I'd like for you to observe that in the numerator, in the numerator, uh, everything has an h, so we could factor an h out so that we would get 8x plus 4h plus 3y, and I factor out the h, and then over h. That's interesting. So now what's the last thing we can do? We can cancel the h's. So now I have a question. Why can we cancel the h's? This is a subtle point that's frequently missed in Calculus 1. Why is it that you can cancel the H's? This is the only reason why you can. If I hadn't given you this additional clause, assuming that H is non-zero, you'd not be able to proceed. Because the question, the question becomes, consider this expression between my fingertips. It has three parameters, x, h, and y. So for this thing that's between my fingertips, is it permissible to plug in h is zero? Like would that, does that, does that violate any rules to plug in h is zero? Nope. It's fine. So h is zero is fine for this one. How about this one between my fingers? Can you plug in h is zero into this one? You cannot. So h is not part of the natural domain of this one, but it is part of the natural domain of that one. 
So it would not be permissible to do this, to edit the natural domain in this way, were we not under the assumption that, eight, that we're away from H is zero anyway. So that's the reason why that's possible. So now, <coughs> taking that, so in a continuation of this, I would like for you to compute the limit as h goes to zero of f of x plus h comma y minus f of x comma y over h. What do you get when you do that? <coughs> yeah, I mean for this for this function that we've that we're still de still dealing with. the limit as h goes to 0 of that expression that we just calculated up there. So 8x plus 4h plus 3y. Well, one of them is easy. They're all easy, but for some reason students have most ease with this one. Where does 4h go? It goes to zero. <clears throat> How about where does three y go? So what does three y go to as h goes to zero? Three y. Why is that? <laughs> Yeah, y is constant with, with regard to h. So then where does 8x go to 8x? So then the answer is 8x plus 3y. Interesting. OK, so now what I want you to do is I want you to, I want you to differentiate f of x and y is equal to, and now I'm just copying that function, 4x squared plus 3xy plus 5. And I want you to differentiate this with respect to x. And I want you to do so assuming that y is a constant. So just as if you were in calculus one. As if you were in calculus one and you're just differentiating like you always do. So the derivative of 4x squared plus 3xy plus 5. Okay, so the first and the last are easy. So what's the derivative of 4x squared? 8x. So no problem. What's the derivative of 5? 0. And then it's the middle one that, at least at the beginning, students have trouble with. So what's the derivative of 3xy with respect to x? 3y. 
because, because we're taking y to be a constant. So now, what if, what if I was asking you about the derivative of 3x? What's the derivative of 3x? 3. three. And if it was 33x, it would be 33. And then, is, no matter what I put in front of x, if it's a constant, like if it's m, some constant m, what's the derivative of mx? m. Now, y is a constant. So if you like, as an intermediate step, I could commute the y to the front and make it look like 3y multiplied by x. 3y is constant. So what's the der derivative of 3y times x? It's 3y. And then the punchline of this, I hope you see, is uh, obviously that's exactly what this is. Why should, that, why should it be that we went through this really pretty tedious procedure and got 8x plus 3y, and then we got it exactly here again? Why did that occur? Why did that occur? Well, that in calculus one, the definition of derivative, remember, is that in the first place you define what a secant line is. You define what a secant is. And then you say, OK, I'm going to hold one of the points of secant attachment fixed and move the other one toward the first one in the limit. And then once those two points coincide, then, it's, then the object in question is no longer a secant line. What is it? It's now a tangent. The derivative tells you the slope of the tangent line by computing the limit of the slopes of secant lines. And the way that looks is like this. The limit of the slopes of secant lines. But that's what we just did, right? We just did that for this function of two variables holding y constant. So somehow there's something really connected here about derivative that you already know and this thing that we just did. Somehow they're really connected. So for now I'm going to set that thread down and move on to something else, but I want you to have seen that there's something that we're coming to. Is there any question about this? Okay. So now, now, one of the main things that you have to take away, there's a lot of things you have to take away from college algebra <laughs> to be successful in calculus one. For one thing, it's just the basic techniques of algebraic manipulation, that's important. But another very important thing is you have to be intimately familiar with lines their equations, what they look like, how to draw them, and that kind of thing. Because, because half of calculus is literally the point of view that locally everything looks like a line, supposing that the, object, that the function is smooth. Things look flat. So you've got to be able to, you've got to have a really strong command of flat things. So let's uh, recall uh, all of our knowledge about lines. So in the first place, every line can be expressed as AX plus BY 
is equal to C where A and B are not both zero. Now when you're talking to a mathematician, it's a little bit like talking to a lawyer. You've got to be real careful about what they're saying. What does it mean where they're not both zero? It, it means that it's fine for one of them to be zero. It's fine for A to be zero. But in the case that A is zero, then what? B can't be zero. Okay. It is also fine for neither one of them to be zero. One of them could be four, the other five, just fine. Okay, good. So let's look at the possibilities here. So let's consider the case when A is zero. So if A is zero, what can we immediately conclude then? That B isn't. And therefore, the equation looks like by is equal to c, because the a term is gone, because a is 0. And because b is not 0, we can solve for y. What do you get when you solve for y? c over b. So now, x and y are the variables. A, B, and C are constant, which means that C divided by B is some constant. C divided by B is a constant. So my question to you is, is that is the equation of a line. How does it look? What does the equation of a line that looks like Y equal constant look like? It's a horizontal line. So this is what they look like. So this case, when A is 0, this is the horizontal case. It's got to be that way because when you say that A is 0, the coefficient for the x is 0, that's the resulting equation, b, y, is c. The equation doesn't depend on x. That means that no matter where you are horizontally, you've got to be at the same vertical position because your vertical position cannot depend on your horizontal position. That's what horizontal lines look like. So now, what about the case when b is 0? What can we immediately conclude? That A isn't. And therefore, the equation looks like AX is equal to C. We can solve for X and obtain that X is C over A. And then we can draw this. Now C and A are each constants, and therefore their quotient is a constant. What does the line that's of the form, if it has equation of the form x equal constant, look like? A vertical line. So, when b is 0, that's the vertical case. Okay. The last possibility, as far as the zeros are concerned, is we, we could be in the case when A is non-zero and B is non-zero. So that is to say, suppose they're both not zero. Then we could solve for Y. So we could take that equation and obtain BY is negative AX plus C and then we could, we could divide by b to obtain mm -hmm. y is negative a over b x plus c over b. So now, what I want you to remember from college algebra 
is that this line is of the form y equal mx plus b. Well, what kind of lines look like that? Not the, not the, not the horizontal kind, not the vertical kind, but what kind? Yeah, the diagonal kind, the sloped kind. So, like this. So every, every conceivable line is expressible with an equation like this, ax plus by is c. And then they can be horizontal or vertical or sloped. Okay, so this is like a brief summary of the things that you learned in college algebra about lines. Now, so, so these are the flat things. <coughs> these are the flat things that exist in a plane. Now we want to talk about the flat things that exist in space. So what's the name of the flat things that exist in space? They're not lines. They're planes. So now we need to know everything that we, everything that we knew about lines in college algebra, we now need to know the corresponding things about planes in, uh, here. So the last thing I want to remind you of is that for sloped lines, this point and this point are of particular importance when trying to understand them. So what are the name of those points? What are their names? Intercepts, right? So what is this one called? Yeah, this is the y-intercept. And then what is the algebraic condition for a y-intercept? What must be true? X is zero. And similarly, this one is called an x-intercept. And it is when y is zero. Okay. So now, every plane can be expressed as AX plus BY plus CZ is equal to D where A, B, and C are not all zero. So I'd like to point out the hopefully obvious similarity between these two conditions. They're quite similar algebraically. So now let's, let's do it in uh, reverse order a little bit. So let's consider the intercepts first. And to help you get a hold of the intercept concept, let's consider the specific plane 2x plus 3y plus 4z is equal to 12. Now, lines have sloped, sloped lines have how many uh, intercepts? Two. Two, right? An x and a y. So, how many intercepts do sloped planes have? Three. 
right? one for each variable. So supposing we had a sloped plane in 17 dimensions, it would have 17 intercepts. Okay, so then uh, how about the x-intercept? What, what is the algebraic condition for to, that's necessary to find the x-intercept of a sloped plane? Yeah, so the general condition, if you want to find the x-intercept, what you're saying is set all of the other variables to zero. So if we were dealing with a, with a 47-dimensional problem and one of the variables was called p, the p-intercept is when every single other variable is zero. So the x-intercept is when all of the rest are zero. So the resulting equation then would be uh, 2x is 12, which is to say x is 6. So here's my question for you. Then what is the intercept? Very good. The point 6, comma, 0, comma, 0. Okay, so let's, let's find the other ones real quick. So the y-intercept, which variables are 0? Very good. Uh, so then it would be 3y is 12, so y is 4. So what's the intercept? Very good. So now, is there, is there any question from anyone why the intercept is 0, 4, 0? Notice that this x-intercept, okay, the 6 is in the x position. For the y-intercept, the 4 is in the y position, etc. <clears throat> and then the z-intercept, uh, well, that's when x is 0 and y is 0. So that would be 4z is 12, so that would be z is 3, so the point would be 0, 0, 3. Okay, so now, now that you've done that, I want you to plot the result. So how would it look? So this one is z. Which one is this one? Y. And so this one is x. So I want you to plot those three mm -hmm. points. And believe it or not, even if you're not an artist, this is not a very tall order. Really, it's not because, um, well, on each axis, we could make tick marks. Right? So how about one, two, three, four, five, six, one, two, three, four, five, six, one, two, three. So, for example, where is the x-intercept? Yeah, and in particular, that point is on this axis, where x is 6. So it's right here. So that's the x-intercept. Similarly, the y-intercept is at 1, 2, 3, 4. y is 4. And the z-intercept is here. Okay, so that wasn't so hard. 
So you plotted those intercepts. Now what I want you to do is that remember that this thing right here that we're dealing with is a plane. This is a plane. I want you to plot. So that, that question is I want you to plot the intercepts. And, and we did that. Now I want you to plot the part of the plane where x is greater or equal to 0, y is greater or equal to 0, and z is greater or equal to 0. So where is that? Where x, y, and z are each greater or equal to 0? I, I I agree that at the origin all those conditions are true, but where where is it? There, it's true in more places than that. So, for example, what I want you to imagine is that right here that point is in the page, and then we've got the x-axis coming out of the page. This is the positive part of the x-axis, but if we were here and we we followed the x-axis to there and then through the page and going back into it, then we'd be on the negative part of the x-axis, behind the page. Okay, similarly, this is the positive part of the y-axis. So like right here, this is positive 6. But we could, we could start traveling that way, and if we go far enough that way, then we get to negative. Similarly, down there. So can you see the part where they're all greater or equal to 0? It's this part that we're looking at. Behind the page, that's where x is negative. On the left side over here, this is where y is negative. Below the input plane down there, down there, is where z is negative. <coughs> so the part of the plane looks like this. So that's the only bit of the plane that you can actually see. So you'd be able to see this much of the plane. And the origin would be underneath it. <clears throat> Interesting. So any question about this? So this is like a little this is not the whole plane. This is just the sliver of the plane that happens to be in that place. It actually, you know, the plane actually extends infinitely far. <clears throat> okay. Now let's play the zeros game. <clears throat> so again, with the equation of the plane ax plus by plus cz equal to d with a, b, and c not all zero, let's consider the case when a is zero and b is zero. So if both a and b are zero, what must be true? that C isn't. And that must mean that the resulting equation is CZ equal to D so that you could solve for Z and obtain Z is D over C. So that's the equation of a plane. And my question to you is, what plane is that? If you were to draw it, how would it look? So the, 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 the form is 
the plane z equal to constant. So let's imagine, to be specific, z equal to 5. What does that plane look like? A horizontal plane. Plane, right? It, because it's a two-dimensional thing. You could walk on it. So, we'd have some z value. Right? It would hit right there. So maybe that's, you know, maybe that z is 5. Then, That way, that way. I hope you take my, my meaning. This is just part of the plane. That's, that's all that I can draw. So that's a piece of the plane. And it happens to be at a positive z value because it's above the origin. Okay, so that's the horizontal plane. Any question about this? Let's try another case. Let's consider the case when, uh, when A is zero, and C is zero. So what can we immediately conclude? B isn't. Therefore the equation is BY is D. So then Y is D divided by B. Now, if this was uh, was the equation of a line, this would be a horizontal line if we were talking about lines. But this is not. We're talking about a plane. What kind of plane looks like y equal constant? What kind of plane looks like y is equal to constant? Now, to help you come to the right conclusion, I'd like to point out, here we had z equal to constant. We had z equal to constant. And let's imagine that it's like, that it was, z, that it was exactly z equal to 5. What I want you to observe about this plane is what it does is it splits the whole space in, into two pieces. The stuff that's above the plane is what's more than 5, has z values more than 5, and the stuff that's below the plane has z values less than 5. So that's what this plane does. It, it, it splits the space into two regions. So now suppose that this is like y is equal to 7. What would the plane y equal to 7 do? Mm -hmm. Good, I like it. Another thing I'd like for you to observe is that this plane right here is at a right angle to uh, the z-axis. So the z-axis is coming right out of it. So similarly for this one over here, So here we have that constant y value, say, right here. <laughs> Exciting. So here's a little piece of that plane. So this plane, if this was y is equal to 7, everything to the right of it, those are points with y value more than 7. 
and everything to the left of that plane is points with y value less than 7. Any question about this one? <clears throat> OK, so now if we can split the space up and down, and we can split the space left and right, then how else can we split the space? Yeah, along x, <laughs> front and back, right? So let's do it for completeness. So how about, so the last pair, we did, we did a and b, both 0, a and c, both 0. So b and c, both 0. As a result of that, that means that we're saying that a is not 0, that the equation looks like ax is equal to d, and therefore it, it is x is d over a. And the question becomes, well, what, does the equi what plane looks like x equal to constant? Well, here's some value. <clears throat> Everything in front of the plane, if, th if this is, say, if this were, say, x equal to 10, everything in front of the plane would have x values more than 10, and everything behind the plane, x values less than 10. <clears throat> Any question about this? So these are all the, the, the simple cases, I guess. So now let's consider the case when a is 0, b is not 0, and c is not 0. So we did the case when all possibilities when two of them are 0. So now we're considering a case when just one of them is 0. If just one of them is 0. OK. <clears throat> well, that means that uh, the equation looks like by plus cz is d by plus cz is d, and we could solve for z. So let's solve for z. Uh, doing that, cz is negative by plus d, so z is negative b over c y plus d over c. OK. And the question is, is what would this look like if we were to draw it? OK. So in the first place, I'd like for you to note that the equation of the plane does not depend on x. It doesn't have any x's in it. And in particular, it kind of looks like the equation of a line. It kind of looks like y is mx plus b, but things are in different orders. So because there's no x, let's just cover up the x-axis for a moment and say, oh, well, yeah, this would be, this would be a sloped line in the yz plane. That's what this would be a sloped line in the yz plane. And because it's a sloped line in the yz plane, that means that it would have intercepts. It would have a z and a y intercept. So let's draw them. Let's, let's say, for sake of argument, alternatively, you could just plug it in, right? When y is 0, that means that the z-intercept is d over c. So let's say that here's an intercept and here's an intercept. So that's the z and the y-intercept. Then <clears throat> there's got to be a plane that's going through both of those points. 
which means that because there's a plane going through both of those points, that means that the line going through those points is part of that plane. So that's part of the plane, that dashed line. And now, this equation, this equation does not have an x-intercept. Why does it not have an x-intercept? This plane doesn't have an x-intercept. Why not? Because in the end, because a is 0, and these other ones aren't, right? So, so <clears throat> what that means is that we just need to imagine taking this line right there and then drag, scraping out a plane, if you like, by pulling that line parallel to the x-axis. So there's a plane coming in and out of the page parallel to the x-axis right there. And it looks like this. So this part, this plane, comes all the way out here and never gets any closer to the x-axis. It's parallel to it. In the same kind of way that you could imagine, like here's a plane, this seam between the floor and the wall is the x-axis. I could put a plane, you can, and you would just be able to see this little piece right here, right there. And it's never going to get closer to that seam. It's going to go all the way infinitely that way and that way. It's never going to get closer to the seam. Any question about this one? <clears throat> so, I think you can imagine the other possibilities, which is to say, well, here I did just A is zero. Well, the other possibilities are just B is zero and just C is zero, etc. So I'll probably give you some exercises to deal with those circumstances. Okay, so any question about these? So the upshot is, is that every flat object, every plane, can be expressed like this. <coughs> and we're interested in flat objects because we're dealing with functions that generate surfaces. <coughs> okay. So now, uh, I hope you've had the experience of they make these little toys that are good for, uh, good to give to young children. They're like, they're sort of like jigsaw puzzles, a little bit, but they're not jigsaw puzzles because you, you, you give them this big board and an example, a typical example would be uh, you push out these puzzle pieces and then you assemble them into a three-dimensional puzzle like a dinosaur, okay? So like you could press out the little bone shapes of a Tyrannosaurus Rex or something, and then you assemble them into a three-dimensional dinosaur. It's kind of nice. So they're like little skeletons. Good. So that's what we're going to do with functions now. We're going to try and draw, figure out how to draw some functions uh, in, a, in the three-dimensional volume by drawing their skeletons. So let's have an example. We'll say let f of x and y be x squared plus 4y squared. Now, what I want you to imagine in the first place, we're going to call this uh, the y equals 0 trace. So what we want to do is we want to plot z is equal to x squared plus 4y squared. And what we're considering right now is what would occur, what would occur if we take the constraint that y is equal to 0. So what would the new equation be? 
if we take y as 0. Mm -hmm. It'd just be z is x squared. Because the y part has gone away now. Well, if we were to plot an xz to, to, to draw an xz axis, what would we see if this is x and this is z? What is the plot of this? It's a parabola. <clears throat> so it would look like this. So that's if we draw it with the xz plane that in the plane of the page. Now my question to you is, is when, when we draw this little piece, how does it look in space? Where is it when we draw the three-dimensional axis? So, <clears throat> so this one is Z, and which one is this one? Y. And this one, x. All right, so where is this red piece situated? Where is it in space? How is it? How is it? Well. It's got to be in the xz plane. It's got to be in the xz plane. So it's got to be in this plane right here. It's coming in and out of the page. So to draw it, <coughs> here's my suggestion for how you draw it. You decide, OK, that's going to be the, the tallest it ever gets. So now uh, what we're going to do is we're going to draw a line through this point parallel to this axis. So the way that I draw parallel lines is I make sure it's pointing toward me. <laughs> okay, so now that's, that's a parallel line. So now I'm going to go an equal distance this way and this way. And then go straight down to the x-axis. So you can see I've kind of given myself guidelines on how to draw. So the top of the parabola is here, the vertex is here, th that top part is here and here like this. So something like that. So that, that piece is situated like that. <clears throat> Any question about that? Okay. Let's try drawing the x equal to zero trace. So what is the equation uh, in the event that x is zero? So in that case, it's z equal 4y squared. Okay, now, if we were to plot this two-dimensional in the yz plane, then what does z is equal 4y squared look like? I'm sorry? 
No. Not quite. The four does change something. What does the four change? It makes it taller, or if you like, compressed horizontally. So it will be a parabola. It will still open up, except it will be like this. So the, the, the red one is, is stretched out horizontally, and the green one is compressed horizontally. That's the effect of that four. That's how it looks when you draw it two-dimensionally. But then how, how is that green part of the skeleton situated uh, three-dimensionally? So how is it sitting in space? Mm -hmm. Yeah, and it looks more or less just like it does now. Let's try one more little bit of skeleton. So let's try the z equal to 9 trace. So I'm choosing 9 because I have specific knowledge about the way it's going to work if I choose 9. OK. So what's the new equation? is x squared plus 4y squared. <coughs> okay, so just replacing the z with a 9. Okay, now what is this when you plot it? The state of Texas promises me that you know what this is. <laughs> what is it? So like when we, when we did the, the y is 0 trace, it was a parabola. When we did the x is 0 trace, it was a parabola again. It, is it a parabola one more time? Not going to be a parabola again. Not going to be a parabola, again, because both of the variables are squared. Exactly an ellipse. So let's, let's figure it out. So to figure out what ellipse it is, you have to know how to transform this equation into the standard form. So in order to get it into standard form, we need to get the left-hand side to be 1. Uh, so I'll, I'll do that by dividing both sides by 9. So 1 is x squared over 9 plus 4y squared over 9. So now the left-hand side is 1. Now, um, you, know the, you know the phrase where you say dividing by a fraction is the same as what? Multiplying by its reciprocal, by, by its multiplicative inverse. So nor that's the way we normally do it. Like when you're dividing by a fraction, we simplify it by saying, no, I'm going to multiply by its reciprocal. But now I'm going to do the opposite thing. <laughs> so <laughs> multiplying by 4 is the same as dividing by 1 fourth. 
So. That means that this is like multiplying by 4 over 9, 4 over 9. So instead of multiplying by 4 over 9, I'm going to divide by 9 over 4. So that's kind of, you may not be totally familiar with that, but I promise you it's above board. Uh, now, I'm going to write that 9 as a 3 squared. So this is x squared over 3 squared, and then plus y squared over, now by analogy, how will I write 9 over 4? So I wrote the 9 as 3 squared. How will I write the 9 over 4? 3 over 2 squared. <clears throat> okay. This is the standard form for an ellipse. So you should be able to tell me what, which, in, in which axis is it longer? Which one is, which is to say, which is the major axis, x or y? x is the major. It's x because what these numbers, 3 and 3 halves, which is 1.5, 3 and 1.5, those numbers tell you the radius of the ellipse. So what this is saying is that the x radius is 3, and the y radius is 1.5. So it's longer in the x direction than it is in the y direction. So drawing this, so if this is 1, 2, 3, Three, one, two, three, one, two, three. So this x, this y. We know four points then that are on the ellipse. What's one of the points? Three, zero. So that's on, that's one of them. And then by symmetry, the other one. So that's two of them. What's the other two that we know? Zero, one and a half. And then by symmetry, this one. So those four points are on the ellipse. It looks like this. Now the question is, is this, that's how it looks like in, in that plane. My question to you is, is that when you draw it in space, how does it appear? How is it situated? Not quite. It's not actually in the xy plane. Why is it not in, in the xy plane? little tricky. One subtle thing you're overlooking. And to give you a hint, I'll ask, in the xy plane, what is the z value? 
zero. But this, this is z is nine, right? So then it's a plane that's parallel to the xy plane, okay, but it's up at z is nine. So it's like we need to take this plane and come up to one, two, three, all the way up to nine. So like up here, say, is nine. So that z is nine. So now I need to draw a plane that's parallel to the xy plane up here at nine. And then, this is the x direction. It's longer in the x direction. So that means that I go out a long distance for, th for that one. And symmetric over here. And then a short distance for this one, and symmetric over here. Is my <laughs> it looks a little pointy to me, but anyway, it's not an art class. So I think you, I think you get the idea. It's this thing, but floating up here. So now the request. Now that you've done these three things, you've done, you've done uh, oh, the y is zero trace, the x is zero trace, and the z is nine trace. Now what I want you to do is I want you to draw all of them together in one picture. See if I can do it. So up here at nine. So it's going to go up to nine there. <clears throat> and then the ellipse is going to be in that plane. So the ellipse is in that plane. And then this is the major axis of the ellipse. And this is the minor axis. And so now, remember, for the red part of the skeleton, what I need to do is I need to make the red part of the skeleton hit, hit these two. Right? So that's what I have to do for those. I have to make the green part of the skeleton hit those two. Let's see if I can do it. That's about the limit of my artistic ability right there. <laughs> That's right at the edge. What kind of thing are we looking at? Uh, also, I hope, that you, I hope that you understand my allusion to those little three-dimensional skeleton puzzles where you're assembling T-Rexes. 
If you've never, if you, <laughs> it's, what I'm saying is nonsense if, you, if you've never seen one of those puzzles. But these are like the little, I don't know what better to say, the skeleton pieces of the puzzle. So what kind of thing are we looking at? What is this? A what? Like a vase, yeah. Yeah. This thing would hold water if, if, it was a, if it was a solid surface. So you actually see these all the time, things more or less like these. Um, but the kind that you see don't have, when you cut them uh, with Z planes, they don't look like ellipses, they look like circles. So if, if we were to squish, squish it in this direction, like, and make the, make the blue not an ellipse but a circle, then it would be a parabolic satellite dish, which you see all the time. Satellite dishes are, are objects that when you cut them in this direction, they're parabolas, and when you cut them in this direction, they're parabolas. Interesting. So this is like a bowl, like a fancy bowl thing. Any question about this? Now, if you were to make more cuts, like cut, 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 then every single one of the cuts, every single one of the blue cuts would be, uh, would be ellipses. As, they, as you're coming down here, they'd get smaller and smaller and smaller until they shrink to a point. And then, when you're underneath it, you would, when you're trying to make Z cuts, you wouldn't hit anything, right? Because you'd be under it. Like for negative Z values, you'd get nothing. And the higher up you get, the bigger the ellipses get. Okay, and then any time you cut it <coughs> parallel to ZY, you get these skinnier green ellipses coming in and out of the page. And then any time you cut it parallel to the XZ plane, you get these uh, wider red parabolas. Okay. Any question about this? So it's, it's a more it's more involved procedure to be able to plot one of these things in, in, in comparison to plotting a typical function in college algebra. Okay. So there is one other kind of surface that I want you to know of its existence. So there's two um, really common kinds of surfaces that I want you to imagine. One of them is like that one we just drew, which is to say it's a function that has a minimum, a lowest point. So a function that kind of looks like, in the end, like this. That's inside of it, so it's shadowed, I guess. I'm not real sure. It has a lowest point. And then you could turn that one over, and it would look like this. So this is a function it has a maximum. Okay, now for this, for this uh, function that has a minimum, no matter how you cut it with vertical planes, you're always going to see parabolas, parabola-looking mm -hmm. things. Okay, so cut it like that, you see a parabola. Cut it like that, you see a parabola. So always going, always going up. Similarly, this one is, you again see parabolas, but they're always going, how? They're always opening down. Okay, now what I want you to imagine, if you can, can you imagine a surface that in some directions you cut it and you get things that look like parabolas opening up, and in other directions you cut it, you get things that look like parabolas opening down. Can you imagine such a, such a thing? Some of the time it's, some of the time it, 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 they appear to be parabolas opening up and others parabolas opening down. Well, let me draw one for you.
Oops. So this is behind, so that it's going down that way. So if you cut it in this direction, then you'll see a parabola that kind of looks like this. So that parabola is opening up. But if you cut it in this direction, then you'll see a parabola that kind of looks like this. So it's kind of going down the other way. So you, you wouldn't be able to see it because it would be behind. So it would be like that. So this reminds people of a certain object so much that this kind of surface is, is named after that object. Does this remind you of anything? A what? A potato chip. <laughs> OK, like a Lay's potato chip. I like it. However, at the time that this was named, Lay's potato chips, I believe, were not a thing. A saddle. Yeah. So this, this is called a saddle. In the sense that, I hope everyone is familiar with a horse, okay? Traveling from, from tail to head is like a parabola that opens up because they, they, their back dips just a little bit. And then if you were, if you were saddled, <laughs> if you were on a horse in the standard orientation, then your legs would be opening down like a parabola. So, so, so the spine of horses are like a parabola that goes up and the ribs of a horse are like a parabola that goes down. <clears throat> okay. Interesting. So any question about these? Okay. <clears throat> Good. So now let's get to some computation. Because drawing is difficult. So section 9.2, which is called something like, yeah, partial derivatives. Well, let's just jump right into it. Let f of x and y be a function. In the first place, the partial derivative of f with respect to x is, now before I define what it is, uh, I'd like to point out that x is a function of two variables. And the reason why this thing we're about to define is called a partial derivative is because it has two variables. And what we're doing is we're telling you only about the derivative with respect to one of the variables. So it is in that sense just part of the story which is why this is referred to as a partial derivative. <coughs> now, as another matter, just a matter of language, it is quite common to refer to a partial derivative as only a partial. So like you could say the x partial. The next thing I'm going to define is the y partial. And if we had a, if we had a function that had 47 variables, then you, know, you could have a, you know, a partial with respect to the 34th variable. Okay, so another matter is that the notation that you use in calculus one to denote the derivative of f typically is f prime. 
the little tick mark. And that's, that's a perfectly legitimate thing in that context. But it's a problem to use that in this context because this function is going to have two partials. Now, if you write prime, it's, it's ambiguous. Are you referring to the partial with respect to x, or are you referring to the partial with respect to y? So we have to have a notation that says, I'm computing a derivative, and furthermore, it is with respect to that variable, and not, as opposed to some other. So the notation to get it right is this. So f and then now prime is a superscript, but for partials you use subscripts. So this is the x partial, and conceptually I want you to link it to the prime notation. So this is the limit <coughs> as delta x goes to 0 of f of x plus delta x y minus f of x y all over delta x. So now, mechanically, <coughs> that is to say where just computation is concerned, this is exactly the same as calculus one. Like you learned how to compute, you learned the product rule and the chain rule and the this rule and the that rule in calculus one. This is exactly the same. In fact, in fact, what we did at this point an hour ago or whatever on this page right here, all of that business so fondly. Do you remember it? This was computing a partial derivative by hand, the long way. So there's literally nothing new here. But what I want to make sure that you understand is the geometry of what's happening. So imagine that we have a function. Here's our function. And then furthermore, imagine that we have some point in the domain of the function, like this point. And it's on that point of the surface. So that's in the domain, and that's the, that's the input, and that's the output of the function. Then. Now we can take this value and what I want you to imagine is that we cut we cut the whole space into left and right pieces right in the right through the middle of that surface so that it looks like this So we we took the we took that object and we cut it right on that plane, and now it's separable into two pieces. Okay, just like with a knife. Then we could take the, we could take those pieces and pull them apart. Okay, then we could I'm holding one and I could dip it in some ink, dip, 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 and then I could stamp it right there on the page. If we were to do that, what you would see is this.
you'd see that function right there, which is a calculus one function. And at this point, because it's a calculus one function, it has a tangent line. And it looks like this. But now I want you to imagine taking this tangent line, which is over here, and putting it back onto this drawing over here. So now it's a tangent line right here, like that, in that plane. What the x partial is doing, it's computing the slope of that tangent line right there. The y partial, which we'll do next time, it's computing, it's saying that now let's cut it this direction so that we can separate it front and back. And what would the y partial, what, what is the slope of the tangent line going in the other direction? And then what we'll do is we'll combine the two slopes of the tangent lines to get a tangent plane because the result will be like this. We'll have a tangent line going this way. So it'll tell us the slope in that direction. And we'll have a tangent line going this way. So it'll tell us the slope of the plane in the other direction. And we'll do that next time. So have a nice weekend. <clears throat>